there's any problem, blame him. Um, what I'd like to do with this, this is an hour long talk, Things a Tester rarely talks about how to talk about coverage, and particularly I mean business level application feature coverage and risk. And what I mean by that is, have we tested enough? What does enough mean? Have we tested all the things? What are all the things? Have we covered for risk? So, not unit level statement and branch coverage. It's not what I'm talking about. Um, let me ask though, what I'd like to do is do a half hour of consulting with the people in the room, because there's not a hundred of you. So when we're probably going to have a more normative experience, instead of giving you a talk, which is easier to do and might or might not be relevant, I'd rather try to do a half hour of consulting, which is going to be harder to do and I might screw it up, but um, might be more relevant. And you'll see what that means. It's a little more interactive with your permission. So let's start it off. Let's say you bring me in as a consultant or Maybe I'm your new vice president of engineering. We lay out all the projects we're working on, all the product plans, all the portfolio of work. It's time to sit down with the testing people to talk about risk, right? So first half of this talk that I don't think we have time for is a series of logical transformations that demonstrate we're never going to be able to do all the testing. There's always going to be test ideas we have that we don't have time to get to. I will say, I do find people disagree with that, and they say, what? Yeah, I test there all the things. And those are usually very, very junior people. that They just don't have the experience. They don't know the failure modes. They don't know the platform, how it fails. They don't know the comp they don't see the combinations that are there. They don't see the long-running scenarios. They just see the feature in isolation. They never make the projects late, but there's always problems in production. Like you, the bugs slip through. So junior tester simply doesn't see all the combinations. Mid-level tester, I can find bugs, bugs all day long. Let me show you all the bugs. Let me show you my expertise. Senior tester, now we start to talk about, yeah, we could test that, but even if it fails, it's not going to provide a ton of value. And we've got all these other things which we should be testing. So we're going to deprioritize these to do those. We see the infinite possibility, but at some point you have to ship some software. That's more of a mature position to take. So if I come in and say, all right, for the software that we're testing today, you've done some kind of analysis to um, figure out what to test and what to skip. To, to come up with the idea of the risks and the risks that we are going to mitigate, the risks we're going to address, and the risks we're going to just let go, because we can't test everything. We all agree on that. Um, and hopefully we have that written down somewhere. And I'm a big, busy executive, so it should probably be a high-level visualization I can drill into. And I'd like to see that for the software you're testing today and for the portfolio of software products that you um, work on as a team. What I'm going to do with the time we have left is gives you a half dozen, a dozen ideas for you to create these visualizations. They should be um, simple enough that you could make one, preferably for free. Maybe it's in your credit card for 10 bucks one time um, that you can share. And they could demonstrate insight. And you might be able to do it you know, over a lunch hour. And your organization will say, hey, this is a cool new thing. Let me show you the thing. And your boss is going to take a picture of it and make it small and put it in a PowerPoint deck to show his boss's boss at the next quarterly review. Um, and you're going to learn it right here at this conference. And it's, it's, it's going to cost you nothing. Uh, if you have a really particularly complex organization that has a lot of moving parts, you might take a day to do something like this. When you do it, it's going to feel like you wrote it on the back of a napkin. You're going to be really embarrassed. It's going to be like this is some, but it's going to create conversations. So what I do is I create some visualization like this, and it should be on a web page. If it's on a web page, I can put it on a wall. If it's on a wall, people will walk by and start talking about it, and they'll find me and they'll say, "This is higher priority than that." And that right? Then 
we can visualize this is the sta known state of the software before release or whatever of our, of our testing. If you're more of a continuous delivery shop, this is the known state of things. And we could emphasize this. We've only got so many hours in a day, so to do more of this is to do less of that. What do we move around? Which is very different than the state of testing today that I've seen with most of my customers, which is nobody knows what the testers do until something breaks, then they ask why you didn't test it. What's your problem? Why'd you screw it up? which presupposes that you're not making some very well-informed risk analysis. So if we have these visualizations, we should be able to say, well, that, that was on the list, and look, it was at the bottom. And we made a decision, which we all agreed on, that it would be at the bottom. And look at the 17 bugs we found that were at the top. Which of those 17 should I have not found so I, I had time to do this thing at the bottom? Right? So, and I'll get into that when I get into some of the examples. Let's go into some pictures, I think. So uh, when we talk about coverage, that, that is, how well have we tested the things? What is your definition of things? Are they features, requirements, test ideas, risks, lines of code, branches, functions, APIs? A whole bunch of different ways to measure coverage. If we measure them at all and visualize it, we're better than most, and we can continuously refine those ideas. So not to mention, during my session this morning, platform, resizing the browser, memory leaks, mobile devices. Our models will tend to inform our testing such that entire categories of error will be completely skipped. This is the biggest problem I have with tools like Selenium, um, that uh, nobody tests printing with Selenium and they end up not testing printing at all. Does it matter? I don't know. That's a different conversation. Right. And the reason, the way that we actually ever ship anything is we say, we believe the value of releasing software now is higher than the value that we would get from continued investigation. And we have a model to demonstrate that. So this is a customer, um, and they didn't, well, I think you mentioned earlier, these are all the test ideas. We're gonna put them in, a, um, we're gonna, how long we take is gonna be a column, and the priority is gonna be a column, then we can, then we can sort that. This is an early customer for our, uh, our lean software testing methods. It's a few years ago now. And they said, we should be able to do all this in a day. So I said, well, fig take your best guess on there. And then, uh, or I think it was a week or something. Take your, take your best guess on there and then calculate. So a business day should have eight times 60 uh, minutes in it and then see how many minutes you actually got done of how long it should take. And then project to see either how much you can get done in the time you're given or how much time it should really take you. And it was a strikingly dif striking difference when they actually used data to predict how long the work would take. Now that was a waterfall shop, it was a few years ago. Doesn't always apply. But at least if we have this sort of sorted priority list, and you, you could have Managers come up and say, this needs to move up, this needs to move down, I think this is really important, I think that's not important. And a predicted cut line, when you get to, okay, Friday at five o'clock, this is where we're gonna be, everything below that cut line isn't gonna be tested. Are we okay with that? And I've had executives say, no, I am not okay with that. You need more time. Okay, you can't ship this thing until Tuesday afternoon. If you insist, so having the visualization can actually change the um, perceptions. When I was a military cadet, we used to do search and rescue in Civil Air Patrol. And we had something called a grid search. So uh, an airplane would crash and the emergency location transmitter would go off. And then um, we would scramble planes to fly in squares all the way around it. Uh, in ex extended squares all the way around it to find information, uh, to, to, to look for the crash site. And you could predict based on, on where, um, the, so there's a radar system. So if a plane is crashing, you'll actually get uh, various uh, hits from the radar system as it starts to go down. And whether it goes down like this or whether it goes down like that, you can project where it's going to be. And you can get your probability of discovery that it is further out and you could cr cr conduct a grid search. So this is an iterative approach to search and rescue. We can do the exact same thing with 
software testing, where I can test the application in five minutes, I can test the application in an hour, I can test the application in four hours, I can test the application in eight hours, how much time are you going to get me? I'll get a trip all the way through the system. Um, I'm, uh, and those represent bugs, right? But um, we can also go through a feature where we go deep into a feature but don't test all the way around the system. Uh, you can create this sort of a visualization and if you actually have four major features, you could actually show how the bugs are and how far out and how high their priority is. A little simpler model is the low-tech testing dashboard. It's about 20 years old. It was created by a guy named James Bach. Um, this is from an actual client. It's a little bit older. We listed the features on the left-hand side. This is an e-commerce app. And then uh, the browsers um, are the columns. Quality is a number. Coverage is a number. They're drop-downs. And then there's some JavaScript that runs behind the scenes that actually colors it. And we had a rubric for what the various quality numbers were and what the coverage numbers were. So coverage of one was I breathed on it and it didn't fall over. Coverage of nine was I test the feature for all the ideas I have. I get the team together. They come up with all of their ideas. We test it again. Then based on the information we learn from that, we do a second round and we're exhausted. We've done an exhaustive testing because we're exhausted. And there was all the different numbers in between. So you could do the drop down and the uh, higher numbers are darker colors. So when I was at social text, we used something like this and uh, the CEO who was acting vice president of engineering said, um, the board is lit up like a Christmas tree. You need to do some bug fixing. And that actually shifted the priorities of the whole development group. I didn't do anything, I just made it visible. Then you could say, we should go to, you know, I want to go to production on Friday. Can we? Turn their head to the monitor and say, I don't know, can we? And this is a Google spreadsheet. So you just give people the URL, they can look at it, they can change it themselves. So much better than the days we all had to be in the same room and we had a whiteboard. And uh, instead of uh, colors, we used to draw like smiley faces with the testing dashboard or frowny faces. Um, I think I've got a template for this that I could share that has all the Google magic with the drop downs hooked up. If you would like it, me too. Another way to do it is just create a mind map on a whiteboard. And you can do the same sorts of things where you can color or underline. So there's the mind map. This is all the features of the app. But then there's the status of the testing. If you can actually, there's a tool called MindMeister. And I think it's five bucks a year, something like that. Um, and you can create mind maps. You can color them. You can um, add, uh, uh, you can color them red, yellow, green. You can say percentages of coverage, how, how well I've tested this feature. And then you can link it back to a um, wiki or SharePoint or something that describes the feature and how to test it. So it's kind of like, at that point, you're actually creating, I'll try to bring it up if we have time. I've got a couple from real customers. You're actually creating living documentation. So um, now product starts to come to you to talk about how the features work and what they should build and how we see the features interacting. And now we're talking about quality and not testing. When support starts to come to you and asking for access for your spreadsheet, for your documentation, now test and QA is driving the company's decisions. Uh, this is a decision tree um, from I think Pete Mellon actually did this. It's for a, it's for a, it's, this is actually for a gas pump. When we started to do put your credit card in and, and what's, your, what's your zip code, the actual number, the actual amount of pro pro programmability of those is incredibly high. So we can visualize this and then we can say these are the things that we test, these are the things we don't test, or we can rotate our testing between builds based on what changed. Um, there's something you can look up, it's called RCRCRC RC, RC analysis by Karen Johnson, which is um, recent core configuration, regression, uh, chronic, and there's another R. So we can actually rank and stack and give our features a score similar to your um, 
defect analysis and say, we think, we think these, these are the most valuable features. Um, so we're going to test them more heavily. And we're going to assign them a weight. And then we say, why did we find this defect in this feature that was assigned a low weight and was deci we decided not to test it through a sort of objective system? Um, this is actually out of a tool called QA Symphony that is a test case tool that will look for a given run, how many failures you have. It will generate your colors. Um, and it looks at the number of test cases for a given requirement. That's not great. As a model, there's all kinds of problems with that. But if you have something like this, it might be one part of a conversation, and it's generated automatically through code. So it's, it's basically free. Um, I, those are starting to come out in several of the tools that are coming out in various different ways. Um, this is from Hexawise. So Hexawise is an all pairs tool. This will actually tell you, so it'll generate test ideas for you. We have this many across and this many wide, which gives us this many possibilities. Well, there's a significant amount of the National Institutes for Standards and Techniques said that 80% of defects come out of the interactions between two components. So again, we can start to drive our decisions with data to say, I think we've done enough testing based on this model. Um, and you can actually see it fill in. The red dots become green as it says, you want this many tests, this many tests, this many tests, that many tests. So how many tests do we want to run? This is just an architecture diagram, but several of my customers, mostly on the e-commerce side, have had significant success with separating the front end of the website, the pretty pictures, from the back end using APIs. So if we can do that, if we make a change to the search API and the search automated tests work, and we have a contract for how that works with the front end, we have some confidence we didn't break anything else. So now if we can deploy just the API, we don't have to regression test the whole system. And once you start to explain that, we can sort of get away from regression test and sort of into testing individual features. But to do that, we have to have really solid contracts for that feature, which means we need really solid API test automation. So you have this, you explain it, you see where we're going, all of a sudden, the time to create the API test automation magically appears. You don't even have to ask for it. This is a Kanban that we did. One of my customers, we were doing the low-tech testing dashboard. It took us about a week to get through it. Sometimes we would carve out things for risk. We'd make things gray and say, I'm not testing that this time. And they said, well, we really want to go live today at 5 o'clock. So can you really give us a go, no-go decision at noon? So I, we could do the dashboard, but it's not fast enough. And um, it's a lot of the same tests we run all the time. So what if we just say a test idea is, should take 5 to 15 minutes, and you can express it um, on a sticky note? It's going to cover a large portion of the system. OK. So come up with all of our ideas, put them on the wall. Everybody gets four votes they think are the most important tests to run. Dot, 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 dot. Sort it. Grab a test, put it in in progress, run and test it. Then at noon, we looked at the wall and we said, this is what we know. This is what we haven't started. These are the bugs we found. And I found this experience. Well, we haven't tested for blah blah, blah. And I say, fair, but we found this bug, which I think is bigger than blah blah, blah and we're going to production anyway, and we're ignoring it. So since we're, we're not going to fix that one, which was the higher priority, why are we overly worried about the lower priorities that we would also wouldn't fix even if we found? Now, there's an argument to be made that is, if there's a pile of low priority bugs, that's a problem. And that's a risk. Can we go making a conscious decision knowing that risk? So I've been, uh, when I was a social text, we skipped performance testing. And I was the one that brought it up. And our vice president of engineering was, our CEO was the acting VP of engineering. And the whole server melted down. 
staging, staging melted down, and we said, oh, it's a problem with the index, or it won't happen on production, and then it did. So during the retrospective, it was the finger pointing, and why didn't QA find that bug? And the CEO of the whole company said, uh, Matt informed me of the risk, and I chose to make a calculated decision, what's next? I dare submit that's a relatively mature process working as it should. We don't see enough of it. So what do we do? Start with visuals, agree on a model, educate that the, the, the definition of a model is it's not the thing. It's just a, it's just a visualization. It's going to have problems. The map is not the territory, but it's better than nothing. Publish it. Put it on a big screen. People can walk by and talk about it. Create conversations. Um, Use the results of prior regression runs to inform, update, and make it a better model. We can put a time backs on it. We're going to put four hours into this thing, and we're going, and we can ship. Then, of course, you continually improve that process until the model is obsolete. Continuous delivery has, continuous deployment has made some of the stuff I've shown you today obsolete for some of our customers. We're very happy about that. That's good. It's all learning. It's all continuous growth. You get a new model. So. Um, toward the higher end of the maturity, we can release continuously. We track the highest risks and test for them all the time. I just threw a whole bunch of stuff at you. Let me ask you a question then. I threw a whole bunch of stuff at you. If you went back to your office tomorrow and tried it, would you really even know where to start? Honestly? I'm seeing some heads say yes and some heads. If you're bobbing your head no, talk to me during the appetizer refreshment thing and let's figure it out, right? I, I said half an hour of consulting. My customers need to be satisfied, okay? And I'm out of time. Thanks everybody for listening.